welcome to another episode of Up To. Ten years ago, Up To started as a live event series showcasing leaders who are as humble as they are successful. The humility piece is extremely important as we identify leaders who can inspire others. We try to focus our interviews on the non-business aspects of their lives. And in doing so, we have found there's a real thirst to explore their hearts and minds in atypical ways. Our host, as always, is Adam Kaufman. And on this episode, we are joined by Ted Souter. If you're a business owner, an executive, or a rising member of a management team, I don't have to tell you about the importance of having team members and partners you can trust. A firm that I've worked with for years and have trusted myself to refer my colleagues to is Vividfront, an award-winning digital marketing, branding, and website development firm based in Cleveland and Ohio, but with clients all over America. Vividfront's focus is on scaling brands digitally. They create holistic return on investment centric strategies and solutions for middle market companies who wanna grow. They do paid advertising, influencer and social media marketing, e-commerce strategies, lead generation websites, I could go on. Their expertise is expansive and their tactful leadership team, all of whom I know, has the entrepreneurial experience to turn ideas into revenue producing business plans. Yes, I am reading a script, but I will tell you that I sought Vivid Front out for this podcast because I already believed in them seeing what they did in the marketplace. So if you're seeking a partner to take your business to the next level, or if you're looking for an opportunity to work for a top agency with an amazing culture, truly an amazing culture, check out their website at vividfront.com or send me a note and I'll introduce you to my friends who run the company there. Vivid Front, great organization. Our guest today is a friend I first met at a European conference of global thinkers seven years ago called the Summit of Minds, taking place in Chamonix, France. Among this super impressive group of thinkers and achievers, our guest today stood out to me, not only because of his creativity and energy, but because of his humility. Obviously uber smart, as you'll quickly gather once hearing him, today's guest has the special skill of engaging others with his warmth and friendliness, rather than leaning on his accomplishments and the smarts as we too often hear or see when we're in the world of technology or big business. He spent 20 years helping write one of the greatest business stories of all time, working at a little company from Silicon Valley known as Google, both in the U.S. and France. He ascended to Google's head of industry retail and also created Google's significant CFO forum. I think we'll talk about that. He now spends much of his time working with organizations and leaders on how to leverage the best of the Google playbook, as he calls it, to accelerate out of the pandemic and into our new digital first future. Our guest today is an enthusiastic board member of 1871, a Chicago-based accelerator which is considered among the best in the world. And he also served as the vice chair of the Chicago Chamber of Commerce, which is a very robust organization. I've been to a few of their events. Today's guest is a graduate of the University of Denver, where he still remains active, and he also finds time to be an advisor to a conservation-focused African travel company. He lives in Chicago with his wife and family, and he was very kind to travel here today outside Washington, D.C., to be with us on the podcast. Plus, I just learned he's a closet deadhead like I am. (laughs) I learned that important news about one minute ago. Ted Souter, welcome to Up To. Adam, thanks for having me. This is great to be here. I really appreciate you flying in. What have you been up to? So I I have to say, and it's kind of obvious, but I'm just so happy to be back in person. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) We've had obviously a very challenging different and different couple of years, and it's been really nice to get back on the road. I'm always happy to get on a plane to go meet with people in person. And you and I were having dinner last night and we're having these breakthrough conversations, learning things about each other, talking about you know today and getting prepared. You can't do that over Zoom. It's not the same. And we and we had a great meal, and so I'm just I'm just thrilled to be here. Well, we're thrilled to have you. So, what have you been up to? I mean, we're, I guess, quasi post pandemic now. So, have you kind of re-entered the work world, or or what has been your cadence like? You know, the last month or two. So it's been an interesting year because I left Google after 20 years. I left in January. Wow and have spent the past six or seven months working on a number of projects. One is in support of the Summit of Minds, as you were talking about. 
um, part owner of the business based in Chamonix, France. And our next conference is actually coming up in a couple of weeks. We're going to be back in Chamonix mm. talking about the biggest topics of the day, really focusing on the intersection of geopolitics, tech, climate, et cetera. So really focused on, on participating in that. I'm going to be speaking and uh, meeting with people on the sidelines and also mm -hmm. doing some exercising because Chamonix is a great place for that. Great place for hiking. Been doing a lot of work with uh, advising some startups, some VC funds on helping them learn a lot of the Google playbook, as you had mentioned, that there's a lot of things as simple as, as implementing OKRs to helping uh, an organization overcome some product challenges, et cetera. So mm -hmm. really taking some of what I have learned, and if I don't know the answer, I can bring in some other people who might be able to help them out a little bit and whatnot. And you mentioned my wife has a safari company called Here Today, Africa Tomorrow. And Here Today, Africa Tomorrow, okay. Yes, HTAT Journeys, okay. and that has been absolutely on fire recently because now people are traveling again. Ready to get out. Africa's a really, really fun, interesting, dynamic place to go to, so her phone's been ringing off the hook, so trying to help out with that as much as I can. Mm -hmm. And then really focusing on kind of my next stage of, of growth and opportunities, and. I've been working with the International Chamber of Commerce, hmm. based out of uh, Paris, France, getting ready for their World Chambers Congress, which will take place next year in Geneva. And this is an opportunity for chambers of commerce from all over the world to come together hmm. and meet, hear from great speakers, share best practices. They have a startup competition, best chamber competition, et cetera. Hmm. And so for me, that's a particular area of interest because I focus a lot on the broader digital transformation opportunity that exists for every entity in the world, whether, whether it's a business or government, a nonprofit, school, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And chambers of commerce for me are particularly interesting because every city and town around the world has a chamber-like organization. Mm -hmm. And they're really at the center of the community with connections to government, finance, business, education, NGOs, et cetera. So my belief, and, and many others as well, is that the opportunity for cities and towns, states, governments, et cetera, to accelerate out of the pandemic really should be housed within the Chamber of Commerce. Huh. And the reason this is interesting, and then I'll stop talking, but the reason this is interesting is because 1871, which is the top rated tech incubator in the world based in Chicago. And you're, you're on the board there, you on were the board on the board. There, yep. Still on the board there, okay. and it's just an incredible organization, was actually born out of the Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce. Mm. So I think that there's, there's an opportunity for other cities and states around the world to mimic what had been done in Chicago to help accelerate their community's acceleration out of the pandemic. And so I've been focusing a lot on that because as we move to a, a post-pandemic world, as you were saying, whether we're there or not, or it's coming, I guess we'll see. What do you think? Are we there? I think we're getting there. And the pandemic- I mean, we're here in person. People weren't wearing masks at the hotels. It's nice to see. So yeah, I, no, it's we're making nice. Progress. To, it's yeah. nice to see people being more comfortable coming back right. to a, a I new hugged normal. people hello today. Yeah. We're not going back to 2019, though. Not yet. We're not going back to the way things used to be or the, right. the good old days. Right. We're going to accelerate into a, a new normal. And there's going to be a, a new way of doing things that might look the same, but actually they're going to be a little bit different. And there's lots of talk about yeah, there. Yeah. But. I think actually you're a futurist. I don't know if anyone has ever called you a futurist. I look at you as Maybe so, a little bit. So I actually plan on asking you about what you think things will look like. But first, uh, if we could talk about Google. You were there 20 years. Yeah. I mean, not just because it's Google, but just one company. A lot of folks in our generation don't stay at one company for 20 years. It's impressive you did. What did you do at Google? So when I started out, I was the I was employee number 302. And there weren't 300 employees at the time. There were just a couple hundred. But I started out working with our biggest advertising partners, helping bring their, at the time, bringing their initial search campaigns to life. And that was very, very early in online advertising. And So around what year is this, just to give us a snapshot? 2000. 2000 2001. 2001, yeah. So a lot of companies still weren't even doing e-commerce yet, or they didn't oh, no, have no, no, online no. That brands. Before that. Yeah. But this was back in the days. Remember the, the flashing banner ads, Punch the Monkey? Mm. That was that was back like oh my early, gosh. early ad days. And so the idea of search advertising and matching an ad to a query was really was really somewhat revolutionary because that's not what 
people were doing. Right. And so really helping businesses come online for the first time to do that. And then throughout Google's evolution, roles changed, um, our areas of focus changed from, from early days focusing on search, then it moved into to mobile, and then we started to get into video when we purchased YouTube to getting into really being an artificial intelligence focused organization. So there's been a lot of iterations. What about you that. personally? Like, were you focused? I think you told me one time, like, you would help Home Depot do more effective work online, yeah. for instance. So can you just maybe break down like a case study of like what you would do with one company just so we can understand what you, what you did there? So I spent a lot of time, interestingly enough, with big retailers like Home Depot, Kohl's, Sears, Land's End, et cetera. And so we own, the team that I ran, we owned their entire Google experience. And so it was really rooted in search advertising. But then search we helped, advertising, okay. Yes. So then we helped develop their mobile strategy. We developed their YouTube strategy. We started to develop their cloud strategy, their, their AI strategy. Hmm. So now uh, all of these organizations have really robust and sophisticated online advertising programs where they're implementing artificial intelligence and machine learning and then they're using technology to create ads to decide what sort of bids to offer and and whatnot so these programs are fully automated where 20 years ago we were doing all of this in a spreadsheet and mm. there were no reporting tools we had right. no idea how these campaigns were performing now these these programs that these retailers are running are highly sophisticated and they're taking advantage of the, the opportunity that the technology is giving them. And the pandemic really accelerated that. For sure. So everybody had some medium to long-term digital investment plan. And it might have been moving, you know, they're one day going to move to a cloud environment or invest more in automation and whatnot. All of a sudden, pandemic hit, all the stores closed. They were all overnight now fully online retailers. Some of them were prepared Forced for Forced to it. be, even if they weren't prepared, they right? Yeah, Some of them weren't prepared for it. Sure. And so- You should have worked harder to get all the companies in America ramped up faster, Ted. You just probably didn't do enough. I know, we totally <laughs> failed. <laughs> so no, I wanted to say about that, like if you think about it, uh, so much of it at first was websites on desktops and then the move to mobile and how much we shop now on our phones. Yeah. And then I think there was a bit of a trend back towards more desktops once people were at home. I know for work, maybe not shopping, maybe it's still state, but was there a move a little bit back towards desktop e-commerce versus mobile e-commerce during this coronavirus, you know, at home couple years? Well, during the, during the real depths when people were literally at home yeah. the majority of the time, and at least knowledge workers, and I guess most workers for that matter, in late March and, and April 2020, sure, you saw those trends happen. But a lot of the spikes in e-commerce, a lot of the spikes in maybe desktop or laptop usage actually peaked mid to late April, getting into May, and then actually started to flatten out over mm. time, then have gone down since. So a lot of the trends have gotten back to what they were pre-pandemic. Mm. So depending on, on the retailer, you're gonna see anywhere from 60 to 80% of transactions involve a mobile device at some point. Now, even post-COVID, yeah. okay. And that was growing. That really spiked during the pandemic, and then you've seen a lot of that growth continue, just because the majority of how people access the internet around the world are on mobile devices. Mm -hmm. So that has only continued to grow. And you've seen retailers and, and every other industry for yeah, that matter, sure. matter really double down on how they're interacting with the customer on a mobile device. And if you are on your phone and you're not finding what you're looking for quickly, or you're on a map and you can't find the store or whatever, that's a poor experience. Mm. And, and most businesses recognize that. In my venture work, I've seen a real increase in the sophistication of bots with the customer service oh. online. Oh. I don't know if you guys were involved with that with your oh, yeah. retailers. And also um, seeing more about the, um, the shopping cart that doesn't get actually purchased and trying to capture more of those um, shopped for but not bought uh, merchandise. I've, I've seen huge numbers of unsold goods that yeah people are trying to figure out how do we get them to actually pull the trigger on that. Yeah. Did, you, did you work on those two areas? We did as well. Yeah. So abandoned carts are a huge 
Abandoned carts. Abandoned okay. carts yeah. are a huge issue. You're saying these important words quickly because they're like second nature to you, but I'm trying <laughs> to learn from you here. So abandoned carts are a big issue, and there's lots of companies trying to figure out ways to do that, whether it's resurfacing your interest or saying, hey, did we lose you? Or here's an offer right. to help you close the deal, et right. cetera. The bot thing to me is particularly interesting because one, from an automation standpoint, it's highly efficient. Yeah. And it is really, really cost effective. The technology behind it is really, really good. But it's actually more complicated than just popping a, a little, may I help you, I'm Mary bot on the screen. You need to, to and we've worked with customers on this saying, how, how does your bot speak to the customer? Is it, is it friendly? Is it straightforward? Is it funny? What's the tone of the voice? If, it, if it's an autom automated bot mm -hmm. with, with actual voice, what is the response when people type into things? And so what we were telling everyone is that it's still very, very early days. Sure. But you can't two or three years from now be like, ah, how did we miss that? Because everybody is going to implement some aspect of automated technology because right. it works and it it's does. getting better and better and better. And it saves money from a labor standpoint. Assuming it's done effectively, it saves money. It absolutely does. And we are in an environment today where retailers in particular and lots of other industries are finding ways to cut costs. I don't like to say really cut costs, but, but to make their dollars go further. Yeah. I like to say remove friction. There you go. Yeah. Uh, Let's talk a little bit more about you, and thanks for that overview of your work there. But what was it like for you working inside such a hyper-growth company? I mean, most people haven't. What, what would maybe surprise us about what it's like to work at a place like Google? It's an amazing organization, and when I, when I left, I wrote a, a really fun note reflecting on 20 years, and if I have to boil it down, what, what gets you excited to leap out of bed in the morning and go to work, and it's the people. Google, like many organizations, has done a great job of hiring smart, fun, ambitious, kind, empathetic, helpful people. And we saw that day in and day out of how they interact with, with each other, how we interact with our customers and vendors and whatnot. And it was really just a magical experience. But the other part of it is we were, as you said in, in the intro, writing one of the greatest business stories of all time, and it just kept going, and it continues to this day. Mm -hmm. That do you think it'll do okay without Ted Suter in the house? Do you think it'll? They were. They're going to. still pretty bullish on, on the company they're on Alphabet. Do just fine. Okay. The, I think that when you posted that LinkedIn summary, and I think that's what you're referring yeah, to. Yeah. I, saw, I think um, Google went down a lot that day, though, because it became known that you weren't there anymore. You're so kind. <laughs> It's so yeah, give us more about what it was like. Was there like pressure to succeed beyond what we would think? I mean, every company has pressure, but I've had other folks who've worked for like Amazon or who worked for Steve Jobs. Like, mm -hmm. was there that type of quarterly or daily or KPI pressure to, you know, what was the culture like maybe a little bit? We, 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 on the outside, it looks like it's fun, it's whimsical, uh -huh. um, but maybe, Give us a peek behind the curtain a little bit. People work really, really hard. And what we've we found is that good organizations hire smart people, give them the tools, big problems to solve, and then let them go. And so we had a lot of really smart people who had unlimited tools to, to get their jobs done or to create things that didn't exist yet. Hmm. That's good. Uh, you had some freedom then. Yeah, and we call it, you know we, people would call it jokingly call it twenty percent time that if you had the ability to spend time outside of your core job to work on things that might benefit the company. In the I like that twenty percent time. But what it really was, instead of spending every, every Friday working on something different, it's really one hundred and twenty percent time. So it's 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 going above and beyond. And I was I would always joke that at Google, like many other places, it, it, nobody does just one job. Everybody does multiple jobs. You're hired for a specific reason, and the expectation is that you come in and you crush whatever you were hired to do. And then you likely would pick up something on the side because people are hungry and interested and, and they have the ability to do this. And right. so I did a number of 20% time projects over the years, and the last one and, and the biggest and one that continues to this day is the CFO Summit. The yeah, CFO. Now it's called the CFO Forum. Yeah, but and you created that. I created that years ago because we found the, and may, I'm sure your listeners are going through the same sort of thing, 
these large digital transformation strategies that everybody is working on or implementing or measuring if they've already done it today, these are like board level discussions. Mm -hmm. When you're moving your entire infrastructure to a cloud environment or you're investing in automation tools and, and you're investing more in online advertising, for example, these, like, this gets discussed in the boardroom. And what we wanted to do was to make new friends in the C-suite. We wanted to influence what's happening in the boardroom. And we spend most of our time with the chief marketing officers, and we love them. But who really has a lot of board exposure? It's the CFO. Oh, they also own the budget. And so I put together a narrative around how digital transformation ultimately, I believe, and Google believe, should be owned by the CFO or at a minimum, a CFO, CMO, maybe CTO combo. And so we wanted to bring together the world's best and most important CFOs together to have these discussions about digital transformation, to give them mm -hmm. the knowledge and the, and the understanding of why this is so important for any business to succeed today, so that then they can walk out the door, go back to the office on Monday and say, I have thoughts on how we're going to approach digital transformation. Google or whomever is going to be our partner, we're going to be more successful. Mm -hmm. And it's about being interesting and being actionable. And so giving them those tools and resources. So on the front end of that, like it sounds like a great idea now. You've already done this. But on the front end, did it take a lot of convincing, a lot of consensus building in-house? I'm always interested in learning how people build consensus. I think that's yeah. one of the most underrated aspects of leadership is the ability to build consensus. Yeah. And it takes time sometimes when you have disbelievers or naysayers or just people you don't get along with. Like, was it hard to build consensus around this 20% idea? <laughs> so it's around the CFO idea in particular? Yeah. So it's funny. I, I, the peer group, yeah. Over time, obviously, we would do this forum in person, and we did it virtually one year. And I've, I've given speeches on it around the world. I was telling you how it was in the, at the time, the yet to be opened new international terminal at the Geneva airport. And I had a room full of executives, CEOs from airports all over the world. And I gave this talk about how they should empower the CFO to own their digital transformation strategy. And about half the heads were nodding up and down and half were kind of nodding sideways yeah. and just a, a, lot of, a lot of blank stares. So it's hard to build consensus. It is, and it's, and it's a fairly controversial topic. It's, it's not super, well, it's definitely not super common. But if you really take the time to have the conversations to dig deep into why the CFO should be owning digital transformation, at the very least, bringing the right teams together, it, it actually does start to make sense. Again, because board level discussions involves often lots of budget, lots of big decisions to be made. And then also we find a lot of C CFOs move into the CEO spot. Mm -hmm. And so we want to kind of seed those leaders early as well. So it's fun. And, and I think probably once a CFO was on board with this idea, when the CFO told other peers of his, other CFOs, this is why I care about this, that probably helped make your case, you not being a CFO mm -hmm. yourself. I have uh, found something you and I have in common is we both are drawn towards peer groups. I call them yeah. peer groups. This is a big peer group you're talking about. Yeah. Um, the Summit of Minds is a peer group of thought leaders from all over the world. Um, these other groups we've been around together, Path North and otherwise, YPO, peer groups. And for me, being in a peer group has been the most significant learning of, of my adult life, more than a university yeah. um, professional learning. And if you think about like 14 year old kids, they tell each other what kind of music to listen to. They don't listen to like the old people recommendations. Right. Uh, I think the ultimate peer group example is AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, and a group of recovering alcoholics experience share on what is it like to recover or go back to work or deal with your spouse. And that model is just proven to work all over the world. So uh, your peer groups with the Chamber of Commerce, it's another form of peer groups, getting leaders of chambers together. Mm -hmm. So I'm going a little bit long here, but I'm just really passionate about the power of experience sharing through peer groups. And I, I commend you for now taking this fondness for peer groups into this chamber work that you're doing. Yeah. So I'll, I'll even take it a step further in that I seek out the opportunity to engage with peer groups on a global scale. There's been nothing more eye-opening and invigorating than sitting in a room full of executives in, 
in Dubai or I was in uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia or in Israel or Nairobi meeting with business executives who face a lot of the similar challenges we do in the US and then a whole host of challenges that would never cross our path in the US. And so understanding how are they approaching this or how do chambers in Dubai and Singapore approach monetization of their membership. Um, having these conversations with other cultures and understanding what's important to them. And it's just, it's so invigorating and it's so important to bring those best practices back to the states, but also to bring best practices from the states to these other groups. And you're just a convener. If you could even convene yeah. that peer group, you get some relationship credit just for convening them, even if you're not the solution, but they're among themselves experience sharing. And yeah. I've learned that the more members of a peer group have in common, so like a chamber uh, CEO in Cleveland or Chicago, Midwest, still different than a chamber CEO in Oslo mm -hmm. or Sydney. Yeah. So the more they have in common, the more they can benefit from each other and learn from each other. So it's, it's, it's wise how you had like just CFOs, not just like executives from America yeah. or just people from the Middle East in this uh, chamber model. So, so on, an, on, a, on a related note, I've been doing a little bit of work lately on not only taking delegations of business leaders to other places around the world, but also hosting delegations who come to the US. And again, convening the right people to have these really interesting conversations. So we took a group to Dubai during Expo 2020. Hmm. And Expo 2020 is the world, the new edition of the World's Fair. So who's Fair. we in that sentence? Is it the chamber group that you're working with? Or this was, this you was and separate. your friends? Or? This was separate. So uh, a friend of mine by the name of Bob Clark, he was the director general of the USA Pavilion at Expo 2020. And through his support, we put together a group of about 25 business and civic leaders in Chicago. Chicago area. And okay. took them over mm. so that we could learn what's going on in Dubai, what best practices from a tourism standpoint mm. or business standpoint, et cetera, and make international connections. So that was really cool. We had a group uh, that I helped develop that included the mayor of Chicago and, again, business and civic leaders to go to Paris this summer to meet with Mayor Hidalgo, to meet with um, Ambassador Bauer at the U.S. Embassy and, and a number of others to learn what's going on in Paris. Hmm. And Paris is doing a lot of things right. And Chicago and Paris actually are sister cities. Hmm. So that was a really interesting couple of days of conversations. And then we're working on bringing a group of business leaders over from Amman, Jordan to Chicago this fall to talk about how we can help our infrastructure build back better initiatives, et cetera, through the support of engineering talent in, in Jordan. So how does that start? Does it start with Jordan's interest or is someone in Chicago reaching out to Jordan? And the reason I ask is because selfishly, I'm Lebanese and I'd love to help you do that honestly with like leaders from Lebanon. So how, does it start on the host country side or the visiting country side? So interestingly enough, it started on LinkedIn. Okay. So I connected with this woman who's the CEO of the American Chamber of Commerce in Amman. And there's the, which is part of a system of the US Chamber of Commerce, partially funded by USAID and other State Department type organizations. And so there's a system of AmCham's all throughout the world, really. AmCham is an American acronym. Cham American Chamber of Commerce. Got so it. AmCham Jordan, AmCham UAE, oh, okay. Amman, hmm. et cetera. Hmm. And so I was connected with uh, this woman, Ragad, who's the CEO. And she's like, we're coming to the States. I'm like, oh, well, I can introduce you yeah. to people. Because one so, thing leads to another. Yeah. So going back LinkedIn. and forth on okay. that. Okay. Huh. All through LinkedIn. So it was less scientific than I, less strategic than I thought, but that's pretty fun. I'm grateful that Calfi, Halter, and Griswold has once again agreed to partner with us. With offices in Ohio and Washington, D.C., this full-service national law firm focuses on all aspects of business and the law, including corporate and finance, intellectual property, and government relations. Let me be clear. I actually approach companies with whom I would like to partner. We just don't accept marketing dollars from anyone. I have been referring my CEO and entrepreneur friends to Calfee for years. I really believe in the firm. One of their notable practice areas is in mergers and acquisitions. And recently, for instance, I introduced a successful entrepreneur in the Midwest to Calfee when he told me that a European-based conglomerate wanted to buy his business. Calfee works with large corporations as well as privately held companies throughout the U.S. and Canada and in Europe and Asia, too. So whether it's selling your own business 
or the more routine needs of creating your first will or anything in between, this firm can really do it all in terms of legal needs. Once again, the firm is Calfee, Halter, and Griswold, and you can find them at calfee.com or on the UpTo Foundation website. Let me switch gears if I could, Ted. You, uh, we have something else in common, Ohio, mm-hmm. and you grew up in Ohio. You were there younger uh, than I was. I think you were there maybe through high school, and then you moved on to Chicago uh, after Denver. But what type of family were you born into? Like, what was your uh, Ohio life like? What was the family ethos, if there was one, or you know, what was what was your early childhood like? Growing up in Ohio was the best. I grew up in Ottawa Hills, which is just outside of Toledo. Really, really small, close knit community. And my par- I had a, my parents, and I have three siblings who are all older than me. Okay. Oh, you're the youngest. I'm the youngest, mm. and very, very close family, and and we're continued close to this day. Yeah, very, very close. That's and good. it was just, it was a, a wonderful upbringing. Ottawa Hills is a great place, beautiful uh, community. And Toledo's got, you know, a great museum and had great, at the time, a lot of great industry, a lot of automotive and glass, et cetera. And my parents were very, very involved. My mom in particular was very involved in the arts. She opened up the Valentine Theater, heavily involved with the Toledo Museum of Art, which is what I think one of the best museums in the world. Hmm. So it's just, a, it was an absolutely spectacular upbringing and experience. And I, I love that we do have that Cleveland, yeah. kind of Toledo Northern connection. Ohio. It's, uh, it's and, great. And was it always clear that you would, in your own mind, like leave and just, you know, tackle the world with a big company like Google? Or was your father a doctor? Or like, what was what was like the path? Was the path up to you? Some families, it's like straight and narrow, and other families allow the kids to go whatever direction they want. I'm always interested in knowing how successful people grew up because it's a big, it's an interesting question, nature versus nurture. Like, were you going to be who you are today, no matter what, or does our upbringing affect that a little bit? I don't know if we can ever say that we knew that we were going to be something or or another. We're we're products of our upbringing, but also we're products of of our environment and our mentors and our friends in school, et cetera. And when we were young, we, we traveled a lot and traveled around the world a lot. And my parents really instilled a sense of wonder and awe and there's Mm. great things out there go experience things it was never so they were encouraging they were encouraged they were encouraging that for sure and i went to boarding school for a while we all went away to college and only my brother stayed in toledo uh, because he had a a, a great law early career as a lawyer and now he's a solar entrepreneur and so it was really just about go do your thing but we'll always be here. And so we would always come back to Toledo and, mm-hmm. and get together and, and whatnot. So. so that's good. Your parents gave you exposure to the world. Yeah. That's not common with everybody. Yeah. Uh, but I did have a guest on, uh, I think of our last episode where he's now been to a hundred countries and he said that his father gifted him the world. I loved how he oh, thought that. about that. His yeah. father gifted him the world. Obviously it wasn't a gift, but exposed him to a lot of things all over the world. But you know, some folks only, have been in their host country. And yeah. so it's interesting to know that you traveled and that kind of exposed you maybe to new ideas and new thinking and different cultures. And and, and I think it's, it's, in, it's important for people to do what's interesting to them. And I, I, have, I have lots of friends who've never traveled outside of the US. Right. And lots of people who grew up in a place and went to college there or, or maybe didn't and they still live in the same place where they grew up, and that's great. That's fine, they, right. You know, that's what, that's right. what's interesting to them, and right. that's, that's what makes them happy and comfortable, and, and I love that. There's no, there's no right or wrong no. way to do this. It just, for me, I've been interested in travel, in other cultures, in other ideas, and, and meeting people, and it's this wild thing where the more people I meet and the more ideas I hear, and the more things that I see people doing, it's like, I want more of that. Amen. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I can't get enough of seeing and learning and experiencing. Um, I mean, so you, and that's I, what, you and I were in the same, excuse me, state of Ohio, but we met on a plane from D.C. to Chamonix, France. Mm-hmm. Like, if we weren't traveling, if we weren't open to traveling, we would have never met. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it's interesting. So your, your family kind of let you become who you wanted to be, which is awesome. And, and you've chosen to now move into a, a major city, Chicago, and you have a family there. 
Can you talk a little bit about, I think a lot about like the role of cities. You, you hinted on the role of chambers in uh -huh. cities, but even a little more broadly, the future of cities. I, I've always lived in big cities. Do you think the COVID kind of uh, forced change of people working remotely will have permanent kind of negative pulls on the city centers or do you still think people will be drawn back to the cities for cultural reasons? How do you, how do you think about the future of cities, not just in work, but more broadly? Cities 100% survive, and they will continue to grow. C cities have been on a, on a You growth. jumped into this answer like you already have a strong I, view. I, 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 do, yeah, I do. Good, I'm good. Ready. Keep going. Cities have been on a growth trajectory for decades, and that will continue. The pandemic put a, put a pause on how people were living in cities and working in cities and enjoying all that cities have to offer. I think cities recover to a, a new level. Hmm. I don't know what that's going to be. I think we're going to see this play out over years. Mm -hmm. But you had a lot of people saying cities are dead and everyone's moving to Palm Beach and, right. and Iowa and Idaho. And all of those places have great things to offer, but I don't think everybody abandons New York for West Palm. I think people will continue to move to Chicago for the quality of life and the cost of living and the lake and, and all the cultural attractions. Detroit saw a huge renaissance uh, over the past decade, 15 years, with the you know, wonderful cultural scene downtown and, and food and startup cultures and Google's opening a huge office there. So I think you're going to see the cities continue to grow, continue to thrive. But what I think you're also going to see is that cities are going to have a bigger stake in decision making of, of how countries run and, and how, hmm. a, how bigger a, a bigger, bigger role. a bigger role, because so many people are going to live in these uh, in these cities around the world that it's almost like some cities are going to be as big as some countries are bigger. Right. And, and so the, the role of cities, I think, is going to start to change. The influence. The influence of cities, I think, is going to start to change. And you're going to have to see how cities will adapt to the growth that they have. Like, hmm. if, if you grow from 10, 15, 20 to 30 million people over the course of 50 years, your infrastructure can't handle that. Your budget probably can't handle that. So mm -hmm. you're going to have to come up with new ways of thinking of how you're going to, you can't just like tax your way into new infrastructure. You have to find ways to, to, to be creative and to come up with new ways to house people, to have people have jobs and whatnot. Yeah, so, innovation in the city is definitely required. And that's yeah. part of why you do like an 1871 accelerator in a city. Yeah. And not every city has those yet. You know, certainly Cleveland has Jumpstart and there are some others, maybe like 20 I know of around the country, but most cities still don't have robust accelerator programs, do they? No. Well, well let me back up. I, I can't. I can't answer that because I haven't been to every city around the world and analyze their startup scene. There's great startups happening everywhere, and we yeah. see that with what Steve Case has been really talking about with Rise of the Rest. That there are smart people building great businesses in every city and town around the world. Yeah. And I, I do believe in that. Cities should be anchoring their future growth and success in a digital economy. And it's not just about having Google or Salesforce or Amazon open an office there and hiring more people, though that will continue. It's about understanding how digital is going to impact the future jobs in your city, how it's going to help make your infrastructure run more efficiently, mm -hmm. how it's going to help you cut down on, on crime. So there's going to be a digital future for every city and town around the world. And my belief, just because I live in this in this world, like you We're do, here to hear your beliefs. That, that that startups are going to be an accelerator of that. And so it would make sense, since cities, states, and countries should root their future success in a digital foundation, that they should be supporting a digital startup ecosystem. Right. And it's not just tech, but it's, it's, it's also health tech. It's fintech. Yeah. It's, it's manufacturing. Small business in general. Small business in general. Yeah. And so what are cities and towns around the world doing right. to build those startup accelerators, those hubs, those, those verticalized groups to bring smart people in and say, okay, start a business that's going to succeed, grow, and help us solve all sorts of problems that we know that we're going to have. Yeah, we call it brain drain or brain gain are you attracting people it's all or, about brain gain yeah or, have to bring or are you smart, losing the people right so bring smart 
thinkers into your community, support them, give them the tools and resources, and then let them flourish, and then provide an environment where they want to stay. And so that's what we've done in Chicago with the Chamber, and then ultimately 1871. Mm -hmm. Lots of other cities are doing it, like you guys are doing with Jumpstart in Cleveland. And so that's a message and a conversation that I like to have with people around the world is, how can we help your city and, and state thrive with a digital ecosystem mm -hmm. that is supported by whatever relevant organization you have in town, what are those best practices that we can share amongst the world? And let's Again, a peer get group. at this. And a peer yeah, group, yeah. yeah. I, I love your passion for this. It, 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 it comes out so clearly. And I know you like public speaking too. Yeah. So what, what do you like about public speaking? What does that do for you being in front of an audience? Because often, when people are asked what they fear the most, it's speaking in front of an audience. Sure. But you like that. I what, do like it. What do you like about it? I, I mean, it, it, and Google taught me this, in that one great thing about public speaking is you're doing something at scale. So if you have a message that will benefit lots of people, if you're doing that in front of 500, 1,000, 5,000 people, that's a, lot, that's a lot easier than doing it in front of 10 people. Not easier, maybe it's more effective. But yeah, a lot of people, would, it, maybe it's easy for you, but it's not easy. A lot of people hate public speaking. I That's why I'm so fascinated that you like it. Uh, I, I well, I like it because I've done you see it the benefits a lot, of it. and I've and I've practiced it a yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah. I always tell my team, proper preparation prevents poor performance. So, and I didn't make that up, but it, it's you get to the point where if you do it enough, it. It, it becomes comfortable, right. it becomes fun and invigorating. And if I can look out in an audience, and half the time the lights are super bright in front of you, you can't see the audience anyway, but it's talking about something that I'm passionate about, it's talking about something that I think is important to at least a lot of people mm -hmm. in the audience. Mm -hmm. And I try, to, I try to make everything I do interesting and actionable. And if I can have people enjoy seeing me speak for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, or an hour, but then they also can walk away with one, two, or three nuggets that will help them solve X, Y, and Z problems. Mm -hmm. To me, that's time well spent. And if I walk into a situation where it's just interesting or fun or funny, I'm not a comedian, mm -hmm. and I don't walk away with something that'll help me do my job or fix something, then maybe that's not the best use. Yeah, it's of not a value, right. I love that you care about the take home value as I call it. We, we and I have compared notes on public speaking before and you definitely care about these nuggets, these three points you want people to leave with. Do you think that, and the reason I ask this is because I've been in front of so many speakers where it seems like they don't care about the take home value. They just wanna show how much they know or how smart sure. they are. There's a lot of that. There is. So you, once again, with this humility and authenticity, which are just fully embodied in everything that you do, you're thinking about the audience, not yourself. I'm wondering if maybe you were in an audience one time where you really had a lot of take home value and you realized that's, that's awesome. This was meaningful. This is how I want to be when I'm in front of groups. Was there something that really crystallized that thinking for you or did it just become second nature for you once you got on stage? Like you, I've been in a lot of situations where I've encountered speakers in a big audience, in a small audience, up close, in the back of the room. I've met a lot of really amazing people over time, and I've seen a lot of examples of what, <laughs> what not to do. <laughs> right, right. And I'm on the board of the Economic Club of Chicago, and it is our job to bring in amazing world-renowned speakers to have important conversations. And I've really been lucky to see some some of the Incredible best. Incredible people. What's one example of that that comes to mind quickly? We had Bono come in a couple years ago, and he spoke about his one charitable efforts, mm -hmm. and one in red and all of that. And people think of him as a rocker. rock star yeah. and you know, getting up there and just you know, singing these amazing songs that were the soundtracks of our lives. Mm -hmm. And he's actually a really smart interesting guy who's doing something with his fame and, and power and celebrity something productive to help people that are in less fortunate situations around the globe. Right. And it was a, a really powerful message. It was interesting. It was fun to see someone do something that you normally don't see him do. And, mm -hmm. and people were joking like, well, give him a guitar and have him sing a song. It's like, you know what? That actually would have been 
well, that would have been cool, but but it, he might have been bored with it. It yeah. would have been out of context, right. and and we're not there for him to sing. We're here to hear him talk about his message, and and I thought that was really interesting. And mm. I, and a lot of you know great CEOs who who get up. Um, I just mm. I, I think it's important to to engage the audience and and help them be successful. And if you can do that, and here's something that I, that I also like to do. Because again, I want people to succeed. It's like I, I make my like I'm there for you. You're you're paying me to engage with you for however many days or whatnot. Like I'm 100% available. And if mm -hmm. you want to set up dinners ahead of time or one on one, you know, with CEOs afterwards, or meet with a small group, or go to the office, like I, I'll do whatever you want. This goes back to your point about the more you're with people, the more engaged you are, the more you want, and the more you like it. But not everyone's like that. But that's awesome. You think like that. Yeah. And I, and I actually had a meeting with a, a friend and mentor the other day who does not do that. Right. He's like, I fly in, I go to right. my hotel, I get up. The Time morning, is money. I give the speech and I'm gone. And I'm like, okay. That, That's not you. That That's works not, for you. That, yeah. you know, that doesn't work for me. So. This actually relates to a question I did want to ask you. Like, where do you think this humility comes from? Because like that attitude is a form of humility. And this whole show's theme is about humility. Leaders yeah. who are as humble as they are successful and I have a firm belief, Ted, that things that we're good at, things that become second nature to us, we're like, oh, it's no big deal, it's just how I am. But I think that's wrong because you enjoy public speaking and you're good at it and you practiced it, but it took a lot of work. Or you're humble, I don't think that just comes naturally. Somebody else might be really good at software engineering. Mm. I can't do that. I don't know. I don't think you do that. No, no, no. Right. But to them, it's like, oh, it's no big deal. It's just writing some code and doing it. So the things that we're good at, we think it's no big deal. But what I'm saying to you is it's a big deal that you care about the take home value of the audience yeah. and you care about having dinner with the group ahead of time if the host committee wants to do that. Like, where do you think this humility in you comes from? Is it like a hereditary thing? Is it exposure to mentors and you liked how they behave? Like, what? There's no wrong answer here, but I, I really would like to get your your mind on that i think it's something that takes it it, it takes time and practice it's uh, you're not just instantly humble mm -hmm. or aware I, you know i of course it for sure started with my parents that they were very humble very kind and really instilled in us kids that that way of, of, of being and being helpful and being there for each other, et cetera. And that, and that stuck with me growing up. I think, I think Ohio just Midwest, yeah. Midwest culturally, I think is like that. And I that you're right. played a huge role, but I, I, I'll give a big part of this is to Google. And there's very much this ethos that, that you go out into the, into the community and you be humble and you help people and you recognize the, the power and the potential of what Google brings mm -hmm. and also recognizing that not everybody has Google or they don't have the resources that you have available. Most to don't. You. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's recognize that and go out and find ways to do good in the world with this enormous power that you, that you have access to for a short period of time mm -hmm. and people really, and, and other great tech companies too. But I, I think in particular, Google really sends its employees out into the wild Hmm. with with this awesome power and and to use it sparingly and wisely and and that that stuck with me well i said no answer is a wrong answer but i do think you're even giving the company more credit i mean you you have something special because i've met folks at these large tech companies and not all of them are humble so i just want to commend you and encourage you to continue this you know, do unto others as you want done to you type of mentality that probably started with your parents in the Midwest. And it, it's, it's really refreshing. So I, I love seeing that. And another uh, uh, point, if I could make, is you're way too young to retire. I know you're not retiring. You yeah. left Google, but you're speaking all over the world. You're doing the work with the chambers. You're helping companies become more digitally astute. You know, what are you most excited about in this next season of your life? So... We definitely don't use the R word. Uh, I'm definitely not retired, but no, I, I, I've been taking this time to get out there and obviously pursue some personal passions, obviously be able to spend an accelerated amount of time with my family, which has just been spectacular. Spent, That's priceless. Spent six weeks in France this summer with my family, and wow. I would never trade that for anything. Right. It was spectacular, and we're so lucky that 
we're able to do something like that. And I also really want to get out there and bring a lot of what I've been able to learn and experience to others around the world. Again, as I said earlier, the past couple of years have been a real challenge and have impacted different people in different ways. The thing that we all need to recognize is that for the first time in really human history, everybody's been impacted by the same thing at the same time. A and real equalizer. A real equalizer. And some are accelerating out of the pandemic better and stronger and, and, a, and faster than ever. And there are others that, that aren't. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen a lot of playbooks rooted in digital that brings together peer groups that will help people be successful for the next couple of years. I and, love that. And being involved in the civic community in Chicago and elsewhere that, you know, ultimately we're here to create jobs. We're here to create economic opportunity. Opportunity, right. We're here to help people succeed at whatever it is that they're trying to succeed at. Mm -hmm. And there are things that cities, states, governments, businesses, nonprofits, schools, et cetera, there are things that they can do that will give them an advantage versus if they don't do it. And mm -hmm. again, it's a lot of it's rooted in what I've learned from the Google Playbook. A lot of it is what we've done uh, at 1871. A lot of it is what I've seen and, and done with, with chambers around the world. And so if I can get out there and try to do things at scale to help people build stronger foundations for the future that will create more opportunity, more economic vitality and, and jobs and stability and a great world. That to me seems like That's time meaningful. well spent. Yeah. And do you know I'll do that for a period of time and and we'll we'll see how things shake out. I, I think the next couple of years are gonna be super interesting. Well give me a few predictions. Uh, I consider you a futurist in my life. Mm -hmm. You've predicted a lot of trends over the years. What what maybe do you see coming around the corner, whether it's a technology or a lifestyle trend or anything you've been thinking about, anything captivating your attention that uh, maybe we hadn't thought too much about yet? So the biggest opportunity for any entity is, is around artificial intelligence. And what is that going to mean for you to better understand the data that your organization is creating? And what are you doing with that data? How are you making better sense of it? How are you slicing and dicing the data so that you can create a better customer experience or a better product or a better ROI or, or whatnot? Mm -hmm. Most organizations generate enormous amounts of data. Mm -hmm. Most organizations are not capturing most of that. Or they're not doing enough with the data that's captured. they're not captured. doing enough right. with it. And right. so what I've been advocating for really any organization is to move to a cloud environment, whether it is Google, Oracle, you know, Microsoft, you know, Amazon, et cetera. And these large tech companies and their cloud environments have capabilities with artificial intelligence and, and machine learning to help you identify, capture, manipulate, and then deploy data in a way that will revolutionize your business. Yeah, the data is such an asset yeah. still untapped. And this could be a whole nother episode. I, I hope you'll come back because I'd love to talk about the data, the artificial intelligence versus the privacy concerns that consumers have. We can't get into it today. It's a huge topic. Yeah, uh, the, the role big tech plays in that, the role that a city might play in that. Um, privacy issues seem to be constantly battling the interests of business and I guess it's just another topic for another day because this time goes so fast. I'm, I'm disappointed. Can, can I just can I just say one thing? If you if the, if you want a growth career move for the future, yes, become a privacy lawyer. A privacy lawyer. See, that's a good trend. <laughs> and uh, we both know a few lawyers, and they're they're sitting not too far away. So a privacy lawyer that that yeah. that could be a pretty lucrative career. We're so early with regards to. Well, we're early with regards to tech in general, right? And privacy is job no, privacy and security is job number one for any organization, whether it's this you know firm here or up to or you know to the largest companies. And there is a lot of regulation that is still going to happen, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of legalities around 
privacy, cybersecurity, decentralization, so on, decentralization Web 3.0, right? And so, if you if you really want a growth opportunity, I think there's going to be a huge need for lawyers there. <laughs> Well, there's a huge need for more people like you in this world, oh, and I am so grateful that you uh, came here today in spite of your busy schedule. All over. Where are you going next? Where, do you have a big uh, speaking gig somewhere around the world? I'm going back to Chicago today, and then I'm going to go to the Summit of Minds in Chamonix in a couple of weeks mm. to talk about a lot of these same topics with smart, interesting, accomplished people. I, I'm sure the dialogue won't be as compelling as it was today, but I bet it'll be pretty good. They, they, they can they can aim and, and whatnot, and, and then we have we have some things on tap for the fall of it. Okay, Ted, thank you so much for being here today. You've been a terrific guest. Thank you very much. It's always a joy. Thank you for listening to the Up To podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe via your podcast platform of choice. To receive our newsletter, suggest speakers, and give your candid feedback, please email Adam directly at Adam at uptofoundation.org. We would love to hear from you. The Up To Podcast is produced by the BL Media Group right outside of the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. See you next time.